Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman, the co-founder, executive vice president, and chief medical officer of the nonprofit uh, CLL Society and a CLL patient myself. Dr. Plotnikoff, can you introduce yourself and just give us a little bit of background of the kind of medicine that you practice? Yes, um, I'm Greg Plotnikoff. I am boarded in internal medicine. I've also completed pediatric residency and been boarded in pediatrics as well. And I have a, a practice based here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, I'm focusing on complex, chronic, mysterious illness. And so we see people with uh, tremendous challenges despite um, good medical attention. We resolve mysteries. So yeah, you see the patients that other doctors sometimes don't want to see. So 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 bless you for that. Yeah, you you, you published a, a paper that um, I was very excited about that talked about diet. And this is this isn't. There are some fabulous treatments for CLL, but the most common, probably up to about ninety five percent of patients when they're diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, is the first thing that says to the doctor is. We're going to see how this goes, and uh, we like to call that active observation. The, the term that's traditionally been used is watch and wait or watch and worry. And most patients say, "You just told me I have an incurable cancer, and you're not going to do anything." Well, if you're not going to do something, I'm going to do something. And one of the most common areas that patients look at is lifestyle, and that's in the most common piece of that is usually diet. And you've done some research on diet in terms of what's a healthy diet, what's not, and I. I'd love to hear about your research and how you think that might apply to a CLL patient who, who's just been told that they have a cancer and doesn't need treatment now, but might down the line. Well, the question everyone asks is, what else can I do? Uh, I don't want to be passive. I want to be uh, take an active role in optimal uh, health and well-being. And gosh, the diet represents at least three choices every day um, in terms of uh, that's a good place to, to look. And we recognize that the standard American diet is anything um, uh, quite a bit less than optimal. And so plant-based diets represent a logical option for people to explore. And when my experience over the past 30 plus years of working with patients is people can with great and positive intention, move towards a very specific diet, but may not have full information for making wise choices. Uh, part of that, um, for example, you know, Doritos and Coca-Cola is kind of meat-free, but isn't. No one would call that a vegetarian or vegan diet or a plant-based diet. It was just kind of uh, so. So a very intentional diet is a very mindful practice and one cannot be mindlessly um, uh, engaging in, in last minute meal, uh, meals. It's just, and one has to be, um, uh, have, uh, have intentional uh, um, approach to this. And what I've seen I'm just going to add one thing in here too, is one of the things that I like about being vegan is that there's a discipline to it too. So, which is about that intentionality. There are things that I'd say no to, even though, boy, that looks delicious. You know, it's, I say, but I'm vegan. I don't do that. It's almost like someone who's, you know, the religious beliefs, you know, if they're kosher or if they're Muslim, or if they're, uh, uh, Buddhist or Hindu, there's certain foods they will and won't not eat based yes. on their religious beliefs. I, I base this just on being vegan that I don't eat certain foods, not that I'm holier than thou, or I'm making it for ethical concerns or ethical vegans, but I just say, no, I'm going to, I don't do that because I'm vegan. So there's a discipline that I think is healthy. Yeah. Yes. And uh, a mindful approach to life, I think is very healthy as well. Um, in, in, in general, um, and so my, my concern is that um, over the past 30 plus years of working with patients, I have seen um, people who have gone through major workups for a variety of health conditions and no one ever asked them about diet. 
and um, it's happened over and over again. So I felt compelled to write this article about the seven questions we physicians need to be asking um, if we are seeing a patient on a plant-based diet um, with symptoms. And um, might there be some issues? Like B12 is a very, very common uh, one, but also vitamin D and, and zinc and a variety of other questions. And it can be very complex. And so this article was written for everyone. It's written for people who are brand new to a plant-based diet, people um, who are senior physicians seeing a symptomatic patient on a plant-based diet. It's uh, lots of information. It was everything I wish that I had been taught in medical school and residency, but in eight years of formal medical education, like not much. Uh, uh, I could draw, I could draw you um, a picture of what vitamin B12 looks like. I couldn't tell you what it means in someone's life. And so this is a, a patient empowerment tool. It's a health professional empowerment tool. And, uh, and, and it's, it's royalty free, so it is there freely to be shared widely with everyone. It's really, it's really written as a, uh, to be helpful, meaningfully helpful uh, for people um, interested in dietary concerns. So I wanna um, grab a, a little more details and dig a little deeper on this because just being plant-based um, and there, there are lots of different reasons, but let's say you're doing it for the health reasons, um, for being plant-based. It, it's very different. Like I would say, if you're doing, like you say, if you're having a, a Coke with French fries and you're ordering the veggie burger instead of the regular burger, versus if you're having a salad and some steamed vegetables and, you know, uh, you know, maybe a homemade soup or something. Help us understand what these kind of different uh, spectrum of veganism is. Um, if you could kind of give us that and any advice you have for somebody who might want to uh, move into a plant-based diet to make sure they don't get some of these nutritional deficiencies. Yeah, so actually, um, vegan um, is the term applied to a completely plant-based diet does uh, nothing of a animal sourcing. Uh, animal sourcing, um, people can recognize as meats, but it's also uh, dairy. It can be, um, some people have uh, things about um, um, animal-derived products like honey, for example, can also uh, be of concern. Um, eggs also, too, I, eggs is another, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, just kind of, um, you know, though it's not meat, it's, it's animal derived. And so um, then there are vegetarians and very, and there are all kinds of spectrum, whether people have this fish and you know, eggs, it's dairy, it's just, there's a, a wide uh, spectrum. Um, and, uh, and now people are talking about plant forward diets. Um, and so maybe, uh, and so the language is, is changing, but there's, uh, wide variety. The, uh, what I get concerned about is that these mindful practices need to be based upon informed, um, uh, informed judgments about where one is getting things like vitamin B12 and and um, essential fatty acids and, um, and seven questions uh, that we go through and um, for for this, it's kind of iron, for example. Are we, being, uh, are we addressing iron? And um, I literally have seen um, people being diagnosed with mental health issues and, and it turned out to be not a mental health issue per se, it was really an underlying nutritional issue. We address it and things like uh, depression and fatigue and insomnia and anxiety disappear not with a pharmaceutical, but with just an attention to a full, complete diet. And that's why I go back to this key point, fundamentals first, then pharmaceuticals. Um, and a related question for people with CLL is, 
if you have symptoms, I, um, it's easy to attribute it to the CLL, especially in a time pressured system. Oh, that's the CLL acting up, or let's check some labs in the CLL, rather than saying, oh, maybe there's a dietary issue here. Man, do we have good B12? Do we have good iron? Do we have good essential fatty acids? What about calcium? What about zinc? You know, um, now, what about the vitamin D level? All these things are, are reasonable and fair questions and easily answered uh, through dietary history and through um, measurements when appropriate. So I understand in the way I approach this, and I'd like to get your sense is that I think that the, the lifestyle issues, diet, exercise, sleep, meditation, stress management, uh, love in your life, all of these things yes. are sort of the, the basis. And But I don't ever think that these things are going to cure my CLL. I mean, I would love if they were, and I'm not against them curing my CLL. I'm so thankful for the breakthroughs that the pharmaceuticals uh, offer me. But, um, but I want to give those pharmaceuticals every chance that they have to work. And I also don't want to develop a second problem, heart disease, a kidney problem, a second cancer. Is, is that kind of your approach too? Or, or give me a sense yeah. of how you frame this for your yeah. cancer patients. Yeah. Yes. Optimal health equals potential minus interference. And uh, so I want to make sure that we minimize interference factors. Optimal response to pharmaceuticals we want to minimize interference factors. Um, and so, um, so we talk about the five fundamentals, breathing, eating, sleeping, moving, loving, living a life of, of connection and meaning and purpose. Um, these are all really important and they're not meant to be curative, but, they, but if they're not in place, they can certainly interfere with, um, with um, uh, optimal uh, health and and one's potential, and so, uh, so we want to make sure that these are, are are not getting in the way of appropriate medical uh, care. Um, and so I, let's go back to this idea about yes, um, one might not one cannot claim that uh, a dietary change is going to cure CLL, but we also don't want dietary insufficiencies, deficiencies, or excesses interfering, um, worsening uh, things. And so, and that's uh, why we cannot ignore um, uh, what role um, a, a less than optimally informed uh, diet can play in overall health and well-being. Doctor Plotnikoff, you and I are on the same wavelength here. Any final thoughts or any messages you would want to give to um, the CLL community? Well, yes, uh, thank you. Um, this article really, uh, and I know you'll provide a link. Please share it widely. Um, we don't want people you know, spending time and money and and kind of all the emotional uh, thing about workups. Um, um, where it could be something very simple like diet. And, um, and so for everyone, uh, this is meant to be shared and, um, and for everyone to, to learn. And it's meant to be, uh, I hope that you see this as an empowerment tool for yourself and for your team of health professionals who you're working with. Thank you so much for your time and your simple and clear explanations uh, of this. Uh, I think you've stated the power of this, but not overstated the power of what can be done here. Thank you so much. Oh. Well, thank you so much. And I wish everyone listening, I'm wishing you the very best of health. Thank you.